Well, Minister, Excellencies, colleagues, friends, visitors, let me begin as always by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose land we meet and paying our respects to the Ngunnawal, the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. It's my very great pleasure as Chancellor of the ANU to welcome the Honourable Sri Arun Jaitley, India's Minister, of course, for Finance, Corporate Affairs, Information and Broadcasting, to the Australian National University to deliver the 18th K.R. Narayanan oration. The Narayanan oration is presented by ANU's Australia South Asia Research Centre under the directorship of Professor Raghbendra Jha, who we're delighted to have here with us, and operates with the support of the Australian Government's Australia India Council, which I should perhaps mention in deference to Minister Jaitley's uh, status as a well-known cricket tragic, uh, that I had the pleasure of launching that council with Alan Border at the MCG uh, back in 1992 when I was Australia's Foreign Minister. Narayan and orations have been among the major public lectures at ANU since they began in 1994. They're given, of course, in honour of the late Dr. K. R. Narayanan, who was President of India from 1997 to 2002, and the first and so far the only member of the Dalit community to occupy that high post. In earlier incarnations, as India's ambassador to both China and the United States and a number of other major countries as well, Dr. Narayanan was once described by Nehru as the best diplomat of the country. That's a pretty formidable accolade given the quality of the India's diplomats and statesmen and stateswomen, as I will know. But in the case of Dr. Narayan, it was thoroughly well deserved. I was fortunate enough to get to know him personally quite well, not least when we inaugurated together, when he was vice president, the ANU's Australia South Asia Research Centre in 1994. And it's hard to think, really hard to think of a more charming, thoughtful and principled servant of his own or indeed any one's country. So ANU is absolutely delighted to host these Narayan orations, both to honour KR's memory and to recognise his many contributions to India and to Australia-India relations. I personally have had quite a long love affair with India since I first visited there, as I told the Minister in the 1960s, travelling for many weeks around the country in third-class trains. And I've been back many times since as a politician, NGO head, and now as ANU Chancellor. On any view, India is not only a country whose land and peoples are an absolute delight to get to know, but it's a country which matters. Country which matters. India's civilizational pedigree has few rivals anywhere in the world, and its economic and strategic weight both in the region and in the world is now undeniable. Indian economy, India's economy is now the third largest in the world in purchasing power parity terms, and it's overtaken China as the world's fastest growing major economy. And I think there is, moreover, every reason to be confident with India now having a government, as we'll hear, committed to economic reform and to deepening its linkages with the rest of the world, it's reasonable to be confident that that momentum will continue. Our speaker today is very much at the helm of these changes. As Finance Minister in the Modi government, Minister Jaitley has been spearheading its very ambitious economic and fiscal reform agenda. He came to that role, Minister Jaitley, with a very big political reputation, as many of you will know, born of his career as a long-serving BJP strategist, both in Bihar and nationally, as a uh, formidably competent practicing lawyer, as a long-serving and very highly regarded leader of his party in the upper house, and I know how hard that particular job is, um, and in his earlier life, something which, which I can also identify, uh, although I was never locked up for my pains, as Aaron Jaitley was, he was a student leader and he was an activist in the civil rights movement in India at the time of Indira Gandhi's emergency. Minister Jaitley's and India's success in advancing the ambitious reform program now laid out, including in this crucial area of financial inclusion on which the Minister will speak today, really does matter a great deal to the whole region and certainly matters to Australia. 
Our economic interests these days are very much converging, with more and more complementarities becoming evident. So too are the geostrategic interests of our two countries converging in a number of important areas, driven as they are not only by Indo-Pacific geography, but also by our common commitment to democracy and very important in international relations, our common commitment to a rules-based international order. So there really could, for all these reasons, not be a better time to be welcoming Minister Jaitley to Australia and to Australia's National University, which I'm delighted to be able to do. We will now hear from, briefly from His Excellency Navdeep Suri, India's High Commissioner to Australia, to read a message from the current President of India, His Excellency Sri Panav Mukherjee. And then, I'm afraid I have to apologise for in my absence, because I've told the Minister I have to rush out to, uh, to chair a national telephone hookup in a few minutes' time. In my absence, we will then hear from Minister Jaitley himself speaking on the new economics of financial inclusion in India. Welcome to you all. Welcome to Minister Jaitley. And we're delighted again to have you here at ANU. Over to you, High Commissioner. Thank you very much, Chancellor Evans. It's my privilege uh, to read out uh, the message from the President of the Republic of India on this uh, very important occasion. I'm happy to learn that the Australia South Asia Research Centre at the Australian National University is organizing the 18th Kiar Narayanan oration on the theme, The New Economics of Financial Inclusion in India by Shri Arun Jaitley, Honorable Union Minister for Finance, Corporate Affairs and Information and Broadcasting at the Australian National University on the 31st of March, 2016. While the Indian economy has made considerable progress in accelerating economic growth and poverty reduction, more work remains to be done to involve a larger proportion of the population in the formal financial sector. World Bank data for 2014 shows that the proportion of Indians aged 15 and over with bank accounts was lower than that for a number of other countries. The proportion of women and of the relatively poor with bank accounts was even lower. A rapid increase in financial inclusion would mobilize savings, create new opportunities for credit offtake, and facilitate increasing prosperity for our citizens. The new Jan Dhan Yojana is a significant step in this direction. Further, the use of biometric-based Aadhaar cards for direct benefit transfers to bank accounts is an efficient method of removing intermediaries in the process of administering government subsidies and welfare payments. The fact that most of these operations can be done through technology embedded in mobile phones should further improve the efficiency of the financial sector and lead to a quantum jump in financial inclusion. This focus on financial inclusion is timely, and I wish the event all success. Signed, Pradha Mukherjee, President of India. Chancellor of the University, the Vice Chancellor, the High Commissioner, Professor Jha, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much uh, to the Australian National University for having invited me for this year's uh, Kyar Narayanan uh, oration. K.R. Narayanan was uh, one of the most distinguished uh, diplomats and civil servants that India produced. He came uh, from a background which reflected historically the disadvantaged groups in India. He grew up amidst all odds and turned out to be one of the extremely brilliant uh, diplomats that India produced and eventually went on to become the 
president of India. Uh, on a personal note, uh, I happened to work closely with him when he was the president because uh, I was sworn in as a minister by him for the first time. And uh, as a law minister in the government at that time, uh, I had to deal with the president uh, quite uh, regularly. And uh, an extremely sharp mind, uh, uh, a strict constitutionalist, uh, given to rules, good governance, good principles, that's the memory of uh, Dr. K. Narayanan that we all have. And I am indeed privileged to join the list of uh, some very eminent people uh, who in the past have delivered his uh, annual oration itself. I was asked by the university to send a written text uh, of the address, which of course uh, Professor Jaha would need for reasons of publishing. But I've always believed that uh, listening to people read out texts becomes quite challenging. <laughs> and therefore, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm not really going to read it out, but uh, refer to some of the uh, basic points which are set out in the text itself. While we speak in terms of uh, reform and growth, in India, a lot seems to have happened in the last two and a half decades. In fact, the Chancellor in his various capacities as a former foreign minister, and even otherwise was mentioning that uh, he's traveled extensively to India, and his initial memories seem to be of the 1968 Indian train, uh, traveling in what was then called the third class compartment. We've uh, come a long way since then. Uh, he did mention uh, my fondness for cricket. And if I go back uh, to where India was in those decades, uh, uh, I remember having read in Steve Waugh's uh, autobiography, when he first made his debut in cricket, uh, he came to India in uh, 1987 to play in the World Cup. And from Mumbai, he, would, he mentions in his autobiography that he would regularly telephone his girlfriend. And the Indian telephone system at that time was that uh, uh, he had to sit next to the telephone uh, the whole night because uh, uh, he'd be added on to what we used to call the trunk call. <laughs> and uh, at some odd hour in the middle of the night, the call would be connected. And while he was speaking to his girlfriend, uh, every three minutes, the operator would say, do you want me to continue the call? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> we've come a long way since then. Today, we have, uh, in 1995, our teledensity was 0.8%. Less than 1% of Indians had a telephone. So that's just about 21 years ago. Today, uh, it's over 1 billion phones. Uh, and that's only one illustration which uh, demonstrates as to where India has moved on from. An economy which was uh, essentially an economy of uh, shortages. I remember when I first became a member of parliament, the transformation was still taking place. And each one of us used to be given a discretion. And the discretion uh, used to be that we could allocate gas connections to people, we could allot telephone calls to people out of turn. And suddenly, within a year or two, I found that nobody would come to me to ask for this favor, uh, because we were slowly turning from an economy of uh, shortages to surplus. And my then leader, the former Prime Minister, Mr. Vajpayee, said that you are only distributing uh, telephones and gas connections he said that he recollected that uh, in his earlier days as a member of parliament, he also had uh, a discretion to allocate HMT watches to people. <laughs> so they were all allowed uh, uh, two HMT watches every year, which they could allot to people out of turn. And that is how in which the manner in which regulated economy in India had uh, worked. But I must say the direction we followed from 1991 onwards indeed served us well. It improved upon our growth rates. Uh, it improved uh, 
It brought down our poverty levels. Uh, uh, last week, I had an opportunity to deliver an annual lecture at the National uh, Minorities Commission. And I was extremely pleasant with the research I did for that lecture that the maximum depletion of poverty rates, even amongst the minority communities, took place post-1991. So as India grew and the economy uh, improved, because prior to 1991, we were quite happy and satisfied uh, as an economy with a smaller base, growing at about 2 to 3% every year. And the world would sarcastically refer to this 2 to 3% growth rate as the Hindu rate of growth. And uh, this was uh, incapable of uh, either depleting poverty levels in India or giving enough resources to the state uh, in order to uh, uh, improve the lot of people which had to be addressed. But post opening out in 1991, successive governments did their little bit. Uh, and the present government seems to be taking that to its uh, logical conclusion. But one important aspect uh, of the economic debate has been that have reforms really helped uh, the economically and socially deprived sections of society. And uh, in the initial years, whereas it was uh, for the then governments a little more difficult and challenging to market reforms because the arguments was that this really has helped businesses, this has helped private sectors to grow, but has it really impacted on the life of those uh, uh, who otherwise have been used to, to living in adverse circumstances? And this includes a very large section of population. We have uh, large sections of uh, uh, scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, which are historically disadvantaged groups. Uh, amongst the backward caste, we have uh, the most backward communities, uh, uh, which didn't have any sources of employment. We, of course, uh, have a, a significant section of the population. Uh, at one stage, it was more than 50, 50 to 60 percent, which lived below the poverty line. We still have a considerable section which uh, uh, leads that life. We have some. Uh, uh, groups of minorities which have not economically prospered as well as the other groups. And therefore, how has this entirely impacted upon them? Sectorally, if we see the growth of the Indian economy, uh, our services sector seems to be the best performing sector. And uh, even in otherwise a global slowdown environment, uh, our services sector even today grows at about 9 to 10% a year. And that's a very rapid pace of uh, uh, the growth of the services sector. Our manufacturing sector can do better. Uh, 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 but it's our agriculture which is the real challenge. And if you look at the inequalities created by the people in the, the, the rural areas, almost 55% of India's population even today is dependent on agriculture. And being dependent on agriculture, the share of agriculture has shrunk to almost below 15% of India's GDP. And that only shows that 55% uh, plus uh, of the population depends on this 15% of, the, uh, of the resource and the income. And therefore, this community is also economically disadvantaged. It's a hard reality which has to be uh, kept in mind. What is then the Indian model of dealing with this? I think one of the mistakes uh, uh, which was made in the pre-liberalization era was, particularly in the 1960s and 70s, that we concentrated on distributive justice, distribution of the existing resource, and did not concentrate on increasing productivity. Both were essentially necessary. And that is why the 60s and the 70s, from the point of view of the Indian economy, virtually became a wasted period, uh, uh, as far as the economy is concerned. Post-liberalization, the criticism was that you are growing faster. But is this advantage of the fast growth rate being distributed enough? And therefore, slowly governments in India have now converged upon an economic model 
were opening out, allowing investment, allowing market-dominated uh, eco economy to grow, faster and higher growth rates is the model. So the question which arose was that, uh, is the pull-up effect or the trickle-down effect, whichever way you call it, adequate enough to take care of those who live in India below the poverty line? And the answer was uh, unhesitatingly no. The pull-up effect does take place, but it's not adequate enough. And therefore, with higher growth rates, you need higher levels of revenue and money available in the pockets of the government, where in addition to giving a boost to the economy, the government can also use it for the purposes of a large number of poverty alleviation schemes. So the Indian model, in that sense, now is more that of a market economy, but with a social conscious, so that the resources earned by the state can also be used to service a section of the population to expedite the process of their getting out of these poverty levels. And that's a model in some uh, 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 larger or lesser measure, successive governments in India have been following it up. Where do we stand today, before I come to the subject of financial inclusion, where do we stand today? Uh, in terms of growth rate, uh, uh, it's a challenging situation globally for the whole world. The entire global economy is uh, facing one of its most acute challenges in recent history. Uh, 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 and I think uh, the new norm itself uh, is unpredictability. It is not stability. Uh, uh, you, we are not sure how long this phase is going to last. Uh, the oil prices, the commodity prices have hit a rock bottom. Growth rates across the world have been impacted. And uh, just uh, two, 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 two and a half years ago, The Economist uh, did a, uh, 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 an important analysis uh, on the BRICS economies. And they mentioned, comparing Brazil, Russia, uh, uh, China, uh, South Africa, and India, And the observation was that there was uh, a possibility of the eye in the bricks, that's India, being knocked off. Now, that was uh, what was being anticipated about two to three years ago. And today, the rapid changes in the global uh, economic order which have taken place, uh, uh, thankfully, have not uh, made that analysis come true. But the eye seems to be a faster growth rate. Are we in India satisfied with this? Uh, Well, if you look at how the rest of the world is doing, I think uh, we are rated as the fastest growing major economy in the world. But if we measure it by our own standards, we believe we can do slightly better than this. As the financial year in India ends today, the 31st of March, uh, we hope to finish this year at about 7.6% growth rate. So our basic parameters seem to be doing well. Last year it was 7.2%. Hopefully we'll be able to maintain or even increase, improve upon this figure depending on certain variables in the next year. Uh, our basic parameters, our current account deficit is well under control. Inflation in India, quite well under control. Last 16 months in a row, the wholesale price index has been negative. The uh, consumer index has been in the range of about uh, 4 to 5% at the highest. Uh, the interest rates are slowly coming down. Foreign exchange reserves are the highest uh, ever. Uh, and till about August uh, last year, rupee, e e other than the Swiss franc, were the only, was the only currency uh, which was able to maintain uh, uh, its pace against the, uh, the US dollar. But post uh, the devaluation in China, uh, 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 the rupee go also got somewhat adversely impacted and the parity got uh, 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 somewhat disturbed. With the basic uh, parameters of Indian economy doing well, where do we feel we can do better? Uh, I think uh, there are three or four variables. The first variable, of course, is the, uh, the global tailwinds. Uh, today, the global situation is obstructive to very high rates of growth. Uh, for one, our uh, 
uh, exports are very adequate, uh, are significantly impacted because uh, global trade itself has shrunk. And therefore, in terms of uh, values, it has shrunk because of the oil prices and the commodity prices. Even if volumes remain the same, uh, uh, in value term, it seems to have shrunk. And therefore, the global situation has adversely impacted on our exports. That is one area of serious challenge that we have. We've had two years of bad monsoon. Uh, fortunately, in Indian history, you've never had three bad monsoons in a row. So on the law of probability, we, 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 we keep our fingers crossed this year. And monsoons, we don't have a food crisis ever in India because we have surplus. But uh, it uh, uh, impacts on the purchasing power of the rural population. And therefore, it has a spiral impact on industry, on manufacturing, on demand uh, in the market itself. So that's an important variable which can add to India's growth itself. Third, of course, is uh, our ability to continue with the uh, reform process uh, and uh, adding to its pace. And the fourth, which is uh, something which hasn't helped the rest of the world, but it has helped us, uh, the low oil prices, particularly the low commodity prices have helped us because we are net buyers. And therefore, we've been able to save a lot of money on account of particularly the fall in the oil prices and divert that resource uh, 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 into uh, uh, more useful areas of operation. Uh, how do I see the reforms uh, continuing in India? I think India still has a great appetite for reforms. Uh, there is a, a clear realization in India that India, post the 1990s, is a much better country uh, to live in. It's doing much better than it was prior to that. And therefore, there is a larger political consensus that governments, both at the center and the states, uh, continuing with reforms. Reforms uh, uh, unleash energies of Indian. They allow free flow of capital into the country. They uh, remove all forms of restrictions. And therefore, with the strength of uh, the uh, entrepreneurship, the economy itself is able to grow. So as a part of the reform process, we've uh, opened up the economy significantly. Almost all sectors are open to foreign direct investment. In greenfield investment, we, are the, uh, we have the largest anywhere in the world which is coming into India. Uh, in the last one year, foreign direct investment itself has increased by 40%. Uh, addition to this, uh, 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 we have uh, 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 we had a bad reputation for not being the best place to do business in and therefore we had to reform our systems and therefore considerable headway uh, work has been done in this regard both by the central government the state's government and therefore there is a significant amount of ease which has come in we've moved up the global rankings uh, we had uh, a fairly aggressive taxation system, a direct tax system, which we've rationalized now trying to bring down taxes uh, to a global level. I was speaking to my uh, counterparts in Australia. Uh, um, uh, our taxes are more reasonable than the ones you pay here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, indirect tax, of course, uh, uh, you've been uh, a decade and a half ahead of us. Uh, we are now trying to implement the goods and services tax. And economists do feel that if we are able to implement it over the next few years, uh, a, a successful GST is capable of uh, adding uh, to India's growth story itself. Uh, our main concentration in terms of expenditure now is uh, into rural India. Because uh, one of the objects of public finance has to be to fill up the pits wherever you find them. And... Uh, 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 of course, on creation of physical infrastructure. I think these are two very important areas where public investment has been going. Our infrastructure, uh, uh, almost every part of it, whether it's the railways, the rural roads, the national highways, the ports, the airports, uh, the power sector, I think these are all areas where there is a huge amount of activity and growth taking place these days. And uh, they require a lot of investment. And I quite candidly concede that kind of investment is certainly not available in India. And therefore, we've been reaching out to investors, pension funds, superannuation funds world over to come and invest in India. And by keeping this entire reform momentum on, we intend to, uh, we intend to uh, uh, add to India's growth story. 
Now, one aspect of financial inclusion, when I spoke in terms of uh, investment in the rural areas is concerned, uh, 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 is to give the benefit of this increased growth to those sections which have so far not received the benefit. So what is our long-term planning about rural India? Uh, President Narayanan's successor, President Abdul Kalam, used to, uh, 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 his favorite subject for discussion used to be that India must end up giving urban-like facilities to rural areas. Now that uh, uh, may be a great uh, uh, vision, but a very challenging vision to seriously implement. And therefore, as a part of uh, an inclusive growth bringing the rural areas, what is it that is happening? We have 700,000 villages in India. And by 2019, we intend each village being connected by a regular Pakka road. Now, the road program for the villages in India is one of the most successful programs. It's a program where every member of parliament is involved in because he, he knows uh, that he has to visit those villages and people then shout at him because they don't have access. Uh, uh, so everybody is involved in that whole process. So this year we've increased the allocation. This is entirely being done by the government. And this year we've increased the allocation between the central and the state government almost three times so that we could expedite this whole process of uh, rural roads. It's a successful program. It's a work in progress. And I think it, it puts in a lot of money into the rural areas. The second thing, out of these 700,000 villages, we found that 18,000 of them were not electrified. And therefore, the Prime Minister has given a call that uh, in the next 1,000 days, all 18,000 have to be individually targeted for electrification. We don't want a single non-electrified village in India. And as I speak to you, Today, last week, we crossed 5,000 out of these 18,000. And the indications are that we may be able to achieve this target a little ahead of time. So electrification of all villages, road access to all villages. The Prime Minister's call for uh, 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 the Clean India, the Swachh Bharat campaign, now speaks in terms of a toilet in every home. So last year, we implemented every school in the villages must have a toilet. So that lakhs and lakhs of uh, toilets had to be constructed. We achieved that target 100%. And now there is a huge campaign in which the government is involved. Uh, uh, the World Bank is also partly helping us in the finance. Uh, Corporate India is putting a lot of CSR money into this campaign. And the idea is to make uh, uh, every home in village and where every home is not possible to make collective community toilets available to villagers in the rural areas itself. Housing for all is a very tall camp order. And in the rural areas, uh, 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 for people to go in for regular pakka houses is yet one of the other programs which is on. In order to fund the farmer, and bring him into this entire inclusive camp, uh, process, the loan that he takes for his crop, uh, the interest burden on that loan, because of the economic pressures on the Indian farmer, farm holdings in India are very small, uh, uh, is being partly subvented by the central government. Some state governments are also subventing the loan. So in several states, you almost have a negligible interest rate. Uh, because it's partly being subvented by the center or the state government. So that's one area of helping the farmer. The previous government had started the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. In fact, I've added to it. I've amended it partly so that uh, it can also result in some asset creation, particularly in terms of water bodies being created in the villages. And uh, the amounts now being earmarked for it are much larger. So that's another methodology we have uh, of a social inflow, starting from... Uh, Tomorrow, a campaign is now being launched uh, to make sure that the payments that these unemployed people get as a part of the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, as I'll explain in the course of the talk to just now, are directly transferred to their bank accounts rather than the monies first going from the center to the state, from the state to the district, from the district to the panchayat, and then being pilfered before it reaches the farmer itself. Now it's being directly transferred to their bank accounts itself. Now, these are various avenues of uh,
funding rural India and empowering rural India, which are on. What is it that specifically the financial inclusion campaign envisaged? Two years ago, we realized that only 58% of the families in India had a bank account. 42% was completely outside the banking network. And the, one of the first programs of the government was to make sure that every family, we have about 250 million families in India, is connected to a bank. So even if you didn't have a balance to deposit money in the bank, it's not merely that people were supposed to come to the banks. The banks hired employees who were called the business correspondents who went from home to home and reached each one of these 42% who were outside the banking system. So those who were opening bank accounts were incentivized by telling them that they would get a, a debit card, they would get uh, a, a facility of an overdraft if they operated that account, and various incentives were given. And in a period of about three to four months, uh, uh, it, it was a spectacular performance by the Indian banks, particularly the banks in the government sector, that we were almost able to add the entire population of India. So it would be stray households now who are outside the banking system. As a pattern, everybody has come within the banking system itself. Now, the poverty levels are such that almost 73% of these accounts didn't have a single rupee in them. They had no money. So how do you transfer resources to these bank accounts? Now, in order to do that, uh, comes the second limb, which is uh, we all government support that goes, it went in terms of giving cheaper products. I think that's the system which is now gradually coming to an end. And therefore, your cash subsidy is directly transmitted to the, how, to the account of every beneficiary. And therefore, you have uh, the central government, the state governments, the local bodies uh, have a large number of support programs in terms of scholarship, widow pensions, old age pensions, uh, 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 minorities uh, scholarship. Now, each one of them is now being transferred to these bank accounts which have been opened. So these have become operational and in a period of about two years, today about 75% of these accounts are actually operational. They have money, people operate them, they use uh, 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 the debit card facility which has been given to them. And this has turned out to be one of the most successful programs. Now building on this, we have a database of what is called the JAM Trinity. The JAM Trinity is the J is the Janadhan account which is supposed to be these bank accounts. A is an Aadhaar card, which I will just explain. And M is those 1 billion mobile telephone connections. So these are the identities people have. We have then created, and now it has got a legislative support in Parliament, we have now created uh, an Aadhaar number, which is a unique identity number, which every resident in India has. Now, already about 1 billion people have been allotted this. The percentage of adults is about 98%, though amongst minor children, it's still lagging behind about 67%, and we, we are adding about 5 to 7 lakh people per day uh, who get this unique identity. This unique identity has some uh, particular features of the individual, as also uh, every individual is now identified by this number. Now, this enables us to identify those who need support. There are a large number of subsidies in India. Petrol was subsidized, diesel was subsidized, cooking gas is subsidized, food for poor people is subsidized, uh, fertilizer for farmers is subsidized. So all these state support subsidies, the challenge with regard to these subsidies was that they were unquantified amounts, which was given to an unidentified section of people. So when the scheme started, uh, 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 each one of us, including me, were getting the benefit of a cooking gas subsidy. Now, there's no reason why this subsidy should have been made available to people like me. So we started a campaign for eliminating those who don't deserve this subsidy. We had a parallel campaign called Give It Up. People should voluntarily give it up. Fortunately for us, the oil prices fell, so we were able to link petrol and diesel to the market. The cooking gas subsidy now reaches 
And if you look at the numbers, the magnitude of the work done, when we opened those Janadhan accounts, uh, 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 the number of accounts which we were able to open were 210 million, 21 crore accounts. So it, it was, and this was all done in a period of about four months. The cooking gas subsidy now goes to the account of 140 million people each month. So do the scholarships and the other pensions and various forms. So these people have some operational balances always available with them. Now this experiment of Aadhaar, now that it has a statutory backing, we intend now using it as a pilot project for fertilizer in the first instance, for food in the second instance, and wherever it is possible, we will see if this can be implemented. On cooking gas, it has given us a subsidy saving of about 25% which is a considerable amount because that's all a pressure on the uh, revenues of the central government. And this money can be utilized for uh, helping uh, the various people. And in order to demonstrate this point, uh, uh, as I'll explain later, we've added this as a part of the social security campaign. The third thing that we did was to use all these accounts and offer India outside the government is an unpensioned society. Most Indians don't get a pension. And there are pension plans, but very few subscribe to it. It's only government or quasi-government employees who get a pension. So I've been saying from day one that there's a need to make India into a pension society. And some of my proposals, uh, though well-intentioned, run uh, foul of a certain section because people don't realize the consequences of when they grow old and uh, 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 would have... Uh, nothing to fall back on. As a result of which, we started offering uh, low-cost insurance policies and extremely low-cost insurance policies. For instance, we have about uh, 130 million people amongst these poor people insured themselves uh, uh, for a two lakh rupees uh, accident insurance. So if a bread earner dies, his family gets at least some subsistence. These are very poor people. And uh, the total amount of premium that was to be paid out of these Janadhan accounts is only one rupee a month, which was a nominal account. And therefore, to bring people into financial inclusion and social inclusion, I think this is a step which went uh, long further. We had similarly brought in uh, uh, a normal life insurance policy, again, reasonably low cost, and a pension scheme for them. The two insurance policies have been a runaway success. The pension scheme is still taking time to register because people have not realized the benefits of those outside the government to have uh, a, a, a pension uh, program for themselves. Uh, I think uh, one day, hopefully, uh, from following from the pattern that you have uh, in countries like Australia, in the United States, and Europe, uh, we probably could uh, insist on people contributing, at least a large section of those who can afford it, contributing for a mandatory pension uh, subsequently. Now, the bank accounts being opened, money is being put into these bank accounts, the facility of uh, insurances being made available to them, and uh, 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 what do we then do with this large body of uh, people? Uh, many of those who can't get a job either in the government or in the private sector. So the next limb of this financial inclusion, which I started last year, was this is an unfunded section of society. And therefore, you have to encourage them to set up businesses and small establishments on their own. So we started what is called the, the mudra scheme of the government, wherein all the banks were advised to give to them microfinance at the bank rates of interest. Otherwise, these people were entirely dependent on money lenders who were lending to them at 25, 30, and 35% a year. Uh, and uh, this was very exploitative. So this mudra scheme has turned out to be a runaway success. And in this mudra scheme, uh, in the first year, the banks were asked uh, as a priority to earmark a certain amount of their lending and lend small loans up to 50,000 rupees, up to 2 lakh rupees, 5 lakh rupees, 10 lakh rupees on a maximum to this section of people 
So somebody would start, uh, a lady in a slum would start a beauty parlor, or somebody would start a boutique, or somebody would become a vegetable vendor. And people started setting up small businesses. So in the very first year, we've been able to support more than about 21, 22 million people already. As the year expires today, I'll probably in the next few days have the final figures for this year. I've rolled over this scheme by increasing the amount by another 50%. So the banks have been this year given, coming year given a larger challenge. And you will have several crore people who get now finance from the bank at the bank rates of interest. Each one of them is given a credit card. They go to the ATM machines. Within that credit limit that they have, they take the money out. And each one of these small uh, entrepreneurs tries to deposit because these ATM machines are open 24 hours a day, to deposit it before 12 midnight so that they can save even on one day's interest. And uh, this has become uh, 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 a, a massive program of financial inclusion. So from bank accounts uh, to state support to insurances to nudging them to go in for pension programs to now making funds available to them to the banking system. And uh, uh, it's quite heartening to note uh, that in this sector, like in most microfinance schemes, uh, which the banks do themselves or through various microfinance agencies, uh, the bad debt is almost negligible. So these are people who want to actually do business uh, and uh, set up small enterprises and who've been uh, doing these businesses. What are we doing with these savings that we are making out of these uh, subsidy programs? So this year I've announced three schemes. One is entirely state-supported that this entire benefit we got from the cooking backs gas subsidy, we've now planned that 50 million families in India, that five crore families in India, in the name of the female head of that family, the government would gift them with cooking gas connections. They otherwise use the conventional chulas. And medical studies have shown that a conventional chula can do as much damage to the lady who cooks her health as uh, in a single day, as much as 400 cigarettes can do. And therefore, these uh, women now from the savings are being brought into the system and they are being nudged and incentivized that the first connection with them will be free, gifted by the state. We pick up the lowest five crore families in India, which is 20% of uh, India, the bottom belly. And each one has been given. So this saving, which we have been able to make by keeping the wealthier people out and excluding the duplicate connections has gone into them. The second area, for the Indian farmer, we've now come out with a very low cost insurance scheme, crop insurance, because if the crop fails, you'll hear stories of Indian farmers being pushed to suicide because they are not able to return the loans. So that he can get back his investment and a little return on that, even if there is a crop failure. So he'll pay, 25% of the premium is to be paid by the farmer, 25% by the state government, 50% by the central government, and therefore any farmer who wants his agricultural uh, crop to be insured has the benefit of that insurance. And the third part of this financial, this monies that we have saved, which we have used uh, for this purpose, is a health scheme which I have announced, which is in two parts. One third of India's population, the lowest one third, will all get at state expense a health insurance which covers hospital charges up to a certain limit of one lakh rupees. Anybody who's a senior citizen in that category will get an additional cover of about 30,000 rupees. And this is an annual uh, uh, insurance policy that they get. And therefore a crop insurance, a health insurance, uh, crop insurance subsidized uh, partly by the, substantially by the state, a uh, health insurance subsidized entirely by the state, and to the weaker sections, a cooking gas facility given in the first instance entirely by the state. Now, this is the area in which uh, uh, we've been taking India's financial inclusion. The net object of this exercise has been that wherever you grow faster, the state gets more revenue, the state is enriched, and therefore, you make your systems in order that in addition to the natural advantage of jobs being created and so on, 
you are able to use this additional resource to pump up into the areas which need to be supported. The last scheme which, uh, as I go back to India, which we are launching uh, in the coming week, uh, is something called Stand Up India. And Stand Up India addresses two sections of Indian society, and that's the last point I have to make. It addresses the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe, which is the socially disadvantaged groups, and it addresses women. So every bank branch in India, public or private, has been requested to support one entrepreneur from the scheduled caste, scheduled tribes category, and one from the women entrepreneur. They will give them a loan up to one crore rupees and create, in the first instance, about 2,50,000 new entrepreneurs coming from these sections, which have not actually seen too many entrepreneurs coming up. That's a scheme we intend to launch as a part of this uh, uh, support to the social sector and the financial inclusion schemes that we have. Hopefully in years to come as governments uh, earn more resources, uh, I think the benefit of resource uh, reaching these sectors itself will continue to increase. That's all I have to say and thank you very much. Uh, On behalf of all of us, I would just like to say a very warm thank you to the Minister for that incredibly insightful and broad-ranging talk. Uh, in particular, I was um, interested to learn about the very innovative mechanisms for financial inclusion that your government has been implementing in India. Uh, we now have 10 minutes, roughly, for questions. If that is all right. Questions, yes. Um, from the floor. So um, if you could just raise your hands and, um, Minister, you might like to come. Oh, you've got the microphone there. Okay. Uh, we've got a question right here, this gentleman. Thank you. Uh, it's always been a pleasure, uh, Finance Minister, to listen to you. And today was no different. My name is Vibhor. I'm a master's student at ANU. So the uh, World Bank says that uh, for economic development, judicial, uh, strong judiciary is necessary. But uh, you look at the Indian judicial system, uh, it's uh, overburdened, chronic, and you have around 40 million cases pending. And uh, the situation is so bad that uh, for occupying uh, uh, land, uh, the notion is that you first do construction, then litigation. So uh, you have an experience as a Supreme Court advocate. Uh, uh, you have experienced this firsthand. So is the Indian government working with, uh, with all the concerned parties to bring the notion of judicial inclusion or judicial security? The second question. Uh, the second question. The NDA government came on Sorry, could we just hold them one at a time? One uh, this is a short one. Oh, OK. <laughs> so the NDA government came on the plank that uh, they will have minimum government interference in business. Now we have the latest case of uh, Mosanto uh, GM Corps, uh, uh, in which uh, the government has intervened to regulate the uh, uh, tariffs. Uh, and Mosanto is not say, uh, now saying that uh, uh, they would like to leave India. So a better dispute resolution mechanism would have prevented that. Do you think that? Thank you. As far as the uh, first part of your question is concerned, uh, I don't think anybody can ever accuse Indian judiciary of not being powerful enough. In fact, uh, uh, I've always believed uh, that one of the basic tenets of our constitutional system is the separation of power. And uh, ordinarily in separation of power, uh, in several countries in the world, particularly those which have powerful governments uh, and some governments with totalitarian instincts. Uh, governments want to, the executive to encroach on the judicial space. Uh, fortunately for us, we have a very powerful and strong judiciary which at times encroaches into the executive space. <laughs> so it's the other way around. Uh, 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 but you are absolutely right when you speak in terms of uh, volumes of cases. It's a matter of concern. And frankly, here, uh, the courts uh, 
have to streamline uh, their systems also. Some infrastructure additions have to be done. We do give funds for it. For instance, one of my greatest regrets is when I was the law minister, I amended the procedural laws of India, which is called the Code of Civil Procedure. And I prescribe time limits for every step that a case must take so that a case doesn't last beyond one year. The time limits which Parliament prescribed by law, the courts, the Supreme Court held it to be directory and not mandatory. So they could continue with the case till the cows came home. Uh, I think there was a need uh, to mandatorily stick to those guidelines. And uh, conscious of this fact and its adverse impact on the investment environment, there are three or four steps which we take. Uh, for instance, commercial arbitrations. Ordinarily, courts don't interfere. But in India, the judiciary being powerful, the courts started interfering, so we've amended the law. I've now provided for a quick fast track arbitration. We've created commercial benches in every high court in the country. We are now trying to put in place uh, uh, an organization for resolution of contractual disputes uh, itself. And therefore, there are, with regard to the commercial uh, investment environment, a lot of steps uh, which have been taken or are in the process. But as far as your second part is concerned, uh, it's not fair for me to comment on the merits of that case because I think uh, the order that the Agriculture Ministry passed is in challenge before some high court. So let the courts themselves decide. Uh, what I understand, I can theoretically say, ordinarily markets decide these matters. Price fixation is now in a liberalized economy decided by the markets. But world over, even in the most uh, market-centric economies, uh, uh, antitrust action is not unknown. Therefore, if uh, markets throw up an exploitative situation, <coughs> who intervenes? And I think uh, the case that you are referring to, uh, these fundamental principles will have to be kept in mind. Um, question right here, gentleman in the blue shirt. Um, thank you, Mr. Jaitley, for taking the time out to speak here. Um, my name's Karan, and I'm one of the ANU students here. Um, you talked a lot about the schemes that the government's implementing, and uh, in, especially in the terms of financial inclusion, and including groups which haven't been part of the formal economy as such. Now, in the past, um, government schemes in India have had a history of at least um, some sort of like license to some extent of not being efficient and of having some sort of wastage and so especially schemes like the, pre, uh, the guaranteed work scheme as part of the previous government um, and things like that. So what measures and mechanisms are, is the government planning to take in place, you put see, in place? I was uh, uh, myself a critic of uh, some of those schemes and therefore learning from the criticism which we ourselves have made, I indicated two things. One, we've linked it with uh, asset creation and a lot of work being done under the employment guarantee scheme is now linked to asset creation. The second, the inefficiency came from the very manner in which the system was designed and therefore with this jam trinity, the, the Janadhan, the Aadhaar and the mobile uh, uh, platform now being available, uh, uh, we are not very far off from a situation where all monies uh, uh, would be transferred to the beneficiaries directly from the, uh, the capital of the central government to the concerned employees itself. And uh, this whole uh, 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 impression that instead of 100 days people were spending 29 days or 39 days, uh, I think once uh, this system is put in order, I'll keep my fingers crossed that the scheme will have to be reassessed. Thank you. Question, a uh, lady in the front here. Namaste, Mr. Jaitley. Thank you very much for your wonderful speech. My work in Australia is related to agriculture and food policy. And your media coverage in Canberra Times today mentioned about 100% FDI in agriculture and food processing, and also 
investment of superannuation into these sectors in India, would you be able to expand on this, please? You see, uh, the, if you look at uh, India's agricultural produce, the popular belief is, and that's what studies have shown, almost 25% of it gets wasted. There is no adequate storage facility, there are no cold chains, there is no processing facility. And every time in the past we gave incentives for cold chains, etc., it didn't work because there was inadequate electricity. And therefore there's no point having setting up a cold chain in a rural area where you get electricity only eight hours a day. Because cold chains will work on energy. Fortunately, we've now reached a stage where we have surplus power. And at least no state can complain in terms of uh, inadequate power availability. So that hurdle being crossed, uh, while preparing this year's budget, uh, one of the important policy announcements I made was that whatever agricultural produce uh, takes place in India, only 4% of it is processed. And this 4% includes 35% of milk which is processed. So then you average at 4%. And therefore the wastage is huge. And this is one sector in which I'm afraid uh, we haven't been able to even uh, develop a great uh, uh, domestic competence. We need both capital, we also need people who are experienced players. And this is a sector which can become highly successful. We have surplus of food products. Uh, uh, your, your, your targeted market in India itself is probably the biggest market in the world. So if you if you if you produce in India, and even if it's meant only for domestic uh, uh, consumers of India, you are targeting uh, a 1.2 billion population. You are targeting almost one sixth of the global population uh, by setting up plants in India, and therefore there is uh, this is one sector which is bound to grow, and uh, uh, so we've given a considerable amount of thought and allowed 100% FDI. So anybody can come and set up. He has to buy the agricultural product from the Indian market. He'll of course have to invest something in the back-end infrastructure. And uh, uh, it's that objective uh, uh, that we had in mind. Uh, question. Um, the lady in the, um, actually the lady in the middle here has probably been waiting longest, yes? Thank you for your talk, Minister. Um, I was just wondering, you talked a lot about the transfer implications of the biometric ID card, but you didn't say anything about the capital Are you looking... Will you, will you just slowly... Um, you said a lot about... Turn the mic closer. You talked a lot about the transfer... Oh, sorry. The transfer implications of the biometric card, where you can transfer money, obviously, to people who aren't, who need it. But what about the implications for increasing your indirect tax base through use of the cards to monitor tax avoidance? Uh, well, you've uh, probably at some stage is not very far off. Uh, this could happen. And, and we'll take your question as well because you, we, yeah, You're just in there. No, 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 I was talking about that, but that's all right. You, Thank we'll you so you much for giving me the opportunity. And uh, at the same time, I uh, just want to say that uh, thank you so much for a very um, comprehensive talk that you have provided today. I had lots of questions while you were talking and every time you were actually addressing. So I thought, okay, this has been answered. And your reference to uh, some of the um, you know, gas connections and telephone, and or quite a few of us can relate to that. Uh, I have a very quick question. You uh, talked about a lot of things, and one of the things you mentioned was uh, uh, providing insure health insurance for the lower, uh, lower socioeconomic strata of the society. What I wanted to say is health care has become extremely expensive in India for anyone, not just the lower socioeconomic uh, um, class. So um, at, at the time while we are providing this health insurance and it's a good scheme, uh, what, what is the government doing something about actually um, uh, investing in 
government hospitals at the same time where a lot of these people go for their health care needs? Uh, you see, let me first of all, uh, by Indian standards, private sector health care uh, is costly. Certain categories of treatments are costly. But if you compare it with global costs, <coughs> uh, I think one of the areas where India seems to have done quite well, particularly in the last two decades, you have around almost all urban centers, not only the big cities, but even the two-tier and the three-tier cities, a set of globally competitive hospital chains have come up. And uh, compared to global standards, uh, uh, Indian hospitals uh, are reasonably uh, more affordable. Uh, 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 I can get into the details, but this is not an op opportunity for that. Of course, there is a still a very large section of Indian population which finds uh, those rates, which by global standards is uh, affordable, but by the standards of Indian population uh, is probably still unaffordable for them. Now, it is that section your question really uh, is intended. So, we have uh, a set of uh, hospitals run by the state governments, the central government, etc. The idea is to expand the public health care system. That's one step. And in the last two years, I concentrated on a lot of government investment in building institutions like the All India Institute of Medical Sciences across the country. Now we have several institutions which are in progress. The problem still is getting the faculty and the doctors uh, uh, there. Uh, their problem is of footfalls. Uh, for instance, you'll have a, a hospital like All India Institute of Medical Sciences where about 50,000 patients will come every day and therefore the, the medical fraternity itself is under a lot of pressure. So you need the volumes to grow. Additionally, what this insurance scheme has done is for a certain category of ailments which require hospitalization, uh, it provides a free support to the one-third bottom of the Indian society. So all you have is you have an insurance card and up to the amount that card permits, you can walk into any hospital and get yourself treated. So this card will enable people to get even treated in private hospitals and which will eventually claim insurance, uh, money from the insurance companies. Thank you very much. Now, sadly, that actually brings to an end our available time for Q&A, but I think that the very thorny issue of uh, providing health care um, for, for entire populations in Australia, the Australian context, it's an ageing population, Obviously, within the Indian context, it's providing it across the nation to all. But it's an appropriate place to end. Uh, I would like to thank you all for your uh, very interesting questions, and I would like to thank the Minister for, uh, for answering all of those questions so fully. Uh, but I would now, it is my great pleasure to invite Professor Raghbendra Jha, the head of the Aunt Corden Department of Economics and Executive Director Australia of the South Asia Research Centre, to pro propose a vote of thanks on behalf of all of us. Please come to the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have one more round of applause for the inimitable <laughs> Mr. Joshi? Unlike him, I'll have to read my speech. <laughs> Thank you all uh, very much for coming to the uh, 2016 Narayanan Oration, the 18th in the series. This lecture, as, as in the past, will be printed along with the President's message and will be available from ASARC. It will be mailed out to all the previous Narayanan orators and, and to Mr. Jaitley's office and it will be widely circulated uh, among the policy community here and in Delhi. So at this time, it is my pleasant duty to bring this oration to a close by thanking the people and organizations who have contributed to making this year's oration such a success. This oration is named after the now deceased uh, Dr. K.R. Narayanan former president of India. Dr. Narayanan inaugurated ASARC in 1994 
and continued his support to SR throughout. Our Chancellor Gareth Evans, who introduced our speaker today, was also present at that launch. Following from President Narayanan, President APJ Abdul Kalam, President Srimati Pratibha Patil, and current President Pranab Mukherjee have all continued their support for the oration series and their association with the ANU. We are lucky to have in the audience both the Indian High Commissioner in Australia, His Excellency, His Excellency Mr. Navdeep Suri, and the Australian High Commissioner to, in, to India, Her, Ex, Her Excellency Ms. Harinder Sidhu, and also senior public servants from the Commonwealth Government of Australia, the Indian High Commission, as well as a number of distinguished guests from India, the Australia and the India Council, and the ANU, including the Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Shirley Leach. Our heartfelt thanks to our speaker today, Honorable Minister Arun Jaitley. To be the Finance Minister of India, the country with the third largest economy in purchasing power terms and the highest growth rate among large countries, and whose economy is replete with both opportunities and challenges, may be daunting. However, Mr. Jaitley is arguably one of the finest finance ministers India has ever had. And this is saying a lot. You saw some evidence of that in his speech, but believe me, there's a lot more. There's a lot, lot more which he has not said about how much he has done for the country and for, global, uh, for, for, the, for the global economy. And this is saying quite a lot because India has had many outstanding finance ministers. During the time that Mr. Jaitley has been finance minister under the stewardship of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, India's rankings have improved significantly in several key areas indicators, including Transparency International's Corruption Index, the Ease of Doing Business Index, FD, FDI inflows, credit ratings, and several others. You name them. Just the, the government has not even completed two years in office. A few, few weeks ago, he presented the budget of the Government of India for 2016-17. It is a remarkable policy document with the finance minister combining fiscal prudence policy certainty and direction, and much needed support to India's vast agricultural sector, which has been adversely affected by two years of subnormal rains, falling investment, and rising current subsidies. Furthermore, Mr. Jaitley's budget combined his acumen for financial planning and policy clarity with strong supportive measures for the less well-off sections of India's society. Economist talks of reform reforms with a human face, a fine example of this, of, of this is the Indian government's recent, recently announced budget. Many of you would know that prior to his joining politics, Mr. Jaitley had a brilliant career as a senior advocate in the Supreme Court of India. He served with distinction in a ministerial role, role in various governments and as one of the most principled politicians in India, no matter whether, whether he was in opposition or in government. I do not have adequate words to thank you, Minister Jaitley. It is truly an honor to have you with us. We wish you all the very best in all spheres of life. ESAC's list of Narayanan speakers reads like a who's who of important Indian public figures, and Mr. Jaitley is a stellar addition to this list. The Narayanan oration now ranks among the very best India lecture series anywhere in the world. I would request Mr. Jaitley to, to stay in touch with SARC and, and, and uh, examine and guide our research. I express my sincere gratitude to the Australia India Council for financially supporting this year's lecture as it has in the past. At DFAT, Jacqueline Ashworth, Peter Trusford, Tim Blotonikov, and the Office of the Australian High Commissioner in Delhi provided invaluable logistical support for organizing this oration. At the Indian High Commission, the High Commissioner, Mr. Suri, and his staff, particularly Mr. Sonal Bajaj, provided critical support throughout. At the ANU, my home, the media office, uh, particularly Penny Cox, Catherine Pierce, and Sandy Hawks were key organizers of this event. In my own department, the Ancordon Department of Economics, our administrators, Hyo Pyong and Sandra Zek, and students, uh, we, we don't know, I don't know what we would do without them. The many students who have helped out with this, with this oration. I would like to thank all of them for their tireless and selfless effort. Thank you all very much.